welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today in the show, we have Jay Spence. He is a psychologist and healthcare executive. He wrote the Kevin MD article, Mental Health and the Balance Between Technology and a Human Touch. Jay, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. We'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, can you share your story and journey to where you are today? Sure. So I originally started out my career as a clinical psychologist. I started in private practice. As part of being in private practice, I think there's a trend over time that you see that you um, end up with patients that you're seeing for longer than I thought that I should be seeing. I think I came out of university thinking that there was the treatments that I've been given to, to be able to get people better in a certain amount of time. And two, three years into treatment, sometimes some of my patients were still coming back, even though I think I've tried every treatment under the sun that I knew I have to get them better. So I got curious about what was going on there, headed back to go and do some research at a local hospital clinic, ended up just being in the right place at the right time. There was a guy there who was a, a maverick psychiatrist. He was just kind of your bow tie wearing odd socks, ready to take on the world. He was at the end of his career and I, he, he kind of changed several things within the healthcare system in Australia. And the thing that he turned his mind to at the very end was virtual treatment. To, this was in the kind of early 2000s or 2000, actually mid 2000s. And he was showing us data that he was getting people better by putting text up onto a website forcing them to read it by calling them up and telling them to read it. And he, he challenged us just by saying he could beat any of our outcomes in the outpatient clinic that he we were working in at the time. And we and some of the other psychologists didn't believe him. And so we kind of went back in to start doing research with him and later realized that was his trick to recruit PhD students. That's how he got us in. And so he got us into a PhD and it was a very fortuitous in the sense that we were just stumbled into being in one of Australia's really early virtual clinics. And obviously the virtual treatment industry has blossomed into telehealth and is now a thriving industry. So we were just in the right place at the right time with a, with a, a clever guy who saw the way it was going to be. So tell me about that transition from clinical psych psychology into the health tech space. What was that um, journey like for you? It was a very steep learning curve. So I started by getting into a business accelerator that was run by a large telco in Australia. It's kind of the equivalent of AT&T and didn't realize that almost none of the skills that I had from doing my master's, my PhD were going to be helpful or useful in starting a business. And that's what the business accelerator was for. But really, I kind of went from having a mindset which was very focused on doing things at a slower pace, understanding that things needed to be done well in order to be able to be taken seriously by the scientific community, to realizing that I needed to move at some type of pace and be willing to take a lot more risk. So I took off the scientist hat or kind of put it down for a while and to put on marketing hat and accounting hat, mm -hmm. a sales hat and all of the other things that go along with starting a business. And there was some sleepless nights, but I think in the end, we kind of got through that period, got the commercialization of the research that I'd done as part of my PhD set up and then took it from there. So we have a lot of clinicians, physicians, psychologists who make that transition from the clinical world into the business world. What kind of advice do you have for them? I'd say the first would be just to be very conscious that it's a the entrepreneurship is a new career I, I had originally thought that this is something that I could balance with my old career and I tried very hard I tried to keep my private practice running I had tried to kind of keep one foot in there the commercialization of a startup especially one that moves quickly becomes all-consuming and it is really about kind of having to take a master's degree in all of those areas that I said before that, you know, you, you need to become a marketer, you need to become a salesperson, you need to be, to be able to understand aspects of touching everything lightly from finance through to customer service. If that doesn't appeal to you, I don't know whether the sleepless nights are really worth it, but the thing that I noticed for the entrepreneurs who had come from a scientific background who did push through the initial phases of, phases of discomfort is, that they had two things that they had that kind of mindset of the system has to change 
and I don't really care what happens. I'm just going to bulldoze through this because I can see something's got to change here. So there's that visionary values based visionary, I think is kind of this, this section. And there was another group that was just incredibly resilient. They were kind of, you know, it went a bit slower for them. They're smart people. They worked through it. They, they weren't as rocked by the different buffers that came through it, but either pure resilience or pure visionary, either one of those two is necessary to kind of go through the stress of needing to learn lots of things within a short period and make it work. Now let's talk about the Kevin MD article that you wrote. It's titled mental health and a balance between technology and a human touch. Now, for those who didn't get a chance to read your article, can you just walk my audience through it and share the story of why you decided to write it? Yeah, what we're seeing at the moment is that there's a transition, obviously, into lots of different forms of digital treatment that is what is historically a very human and relational form of treatment. And the changes that we're seeing are happening really rapidly. And some of these things mean that there needs to be this consistent awareness of how we might be able to retain the components of human treatment within a digital world. To give you an example, one of the trends that we've seen has been a really strong transition towards people using chatbots, which is essentially just chatting with a, an algorithm that doesn't have any human element whatsoever. And there's been uptake of those types of treatments from lots of different demographics. I think we're still understanding who, what, where, and when we need to use those types of interventions with. But one of the things that we're seeing also is that there needs to be really clear off ramps to be able to access human care at the right time. Digital interventions are great ways to get started, obviously, but for a lot of people, I think that there's a sense that perhaps that's the, the be all and end all of the intervention, especially if you're kind of growing up in an era of being a younger person where you might not have had the experience of doing therapy or had the experience of doing coaching. Digital is safe and digital is what a lot of people know, especially if they're younger. But what we've really seen is that there's this need to do two things really well. One of them is to be able to understand how do we facilitate care towards a real person in a way that's titrated. So having low intensity treatments for people that are able to just kind of come in and get what they need that might be a bit more towards the well spectrum moderate intensity treatments like coaching, telehealth coaching, those types of interventions for when it's needed by the group that might be at risk and more high intensity treatments like your therapy, counseling, telehealth and face-to-face -face and case management for people who are starting to drop off. So digital systems need to allow for that. And I think we've seen, that's where we've seen more recently with the merger between Ginger, which is a coaching company and Headspace Health, which is traditionally a meditation app because I, I would imagine that what they've seen is you, you can't go for a purely digital play that has to have the human touch, which is the coaching element that Ginger has. And the combination of those types of entities where you can say, this is a best practice meditation app, and this is a great organization that provides coaching. So how do we actually manage to, to provide the human touch within the digital and make sure that these systems function well over time? Are there specific behavioral health conditions that are more amenable to a digital solution? Yeah, I think it's more about the severity rather than the condition. Mm -hmm. So digital health interventions are, have been tested in lots of different conditions. And, and the really interesting thing to me about digital interventions and what I mean by that is usually a, a digital course, an evidence-based digital course that teaches a skill like cognitive behavior therapy through videos on an app or something like that that has some type of phone coaching element or video coaching element to it. Those are the, the, the ones with the strongest evidence, but they're, they're quite brief and the phone coaching element can be quite short. Those interventions have been tested across a wide range of presentations. So there's interventions to say that that can work with conditions as severe and problematic as schizophrenia. But really where the evidence sits for this is the more the lower the person's symptoms are, the more that they'll be able to recover from digital methodology, the more severe their symptoms become, the more that they're likely to be able to need some type of phone coaching or video coaching methodology. Or sometimes it's about a combination of a face-to-face -face treatment with a digital treatment. So a therapist sees the person in their office, but they recommend a digital treatment as part of their therapy 
so that they can essentially get the self-help or the, the, the training, the tr doing CBT on your own through the app while you focus on the more relational principles of treatment with the therapist in the office. So you mentioned digital therapy a couple of times. So what exactly would that entail? You mentioned things like chatbot, you mentioned mm. CBT therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, is it just video one-on-one? So, so specifically, what kind of digital therapies are you talking about? Glad you asked. It's a growing area and even I find it hard to understand what's in that box sometimes. So digital therapy at, at its kind of highest parent term is probably encompasses something which is referred to in, as an e-health intervention. An e-health intervention has lots of subcategories sitting underneath it. There are interventions that I spoke about where it's chatbot. That's usually a purely digital intervention that's lived via an app or a web page where somebody's talking to an algorithm that's just a large decision tree, things that they can explore into. And each of those decision trees might be something like, are you feeling stressed today? Would you like me to give you some information on how to handle that stress? Then the person is presented with the kind of best practice information via text or video. Then you move into things like computerized CBT. It's also called iCBT. And what those interventions are, are those digital courses with or without phone coaching that I was talking about. So there's lots of versions of this, and that's probably, these are the interventions that are, that are very strongly supported by evidence because what they're doing is delivering an evidence-based course, like delivering doses of cognitive behavior therapy with the support, support of a coach. And that coach can be a lay person, somebody who's had kind of minimal coaching training, or they can be a specialist, like a psychologist, clinical psychologist, a psychiatrist, who, who phones them up, talks to them about the content, moves them through the content, and the dosage is essentially moving through those modules within the course. Then also under e-health interventions, you've got a raft of different telehealth style interventions. So chat-based therapy, video-based therapy, and the evidence for those styles of therapy is growing over time to the point where video-style intervention is now a fairly established intervention. It didn't used to be, and the, inter the outcome is being similar to face-to-face -face in some settings. So walk us through a real-world success story or a case study. Tell us about a, a typical patient, what kind of condition he or she would have, and what kind of digital interventions you could offer this patient? Well, I mean, the good news is there's been lots because these interventions have been around for some time. So I've, I've seen success across the spectrum with lots of different types of people. But where I, I might kind of take you back to the beginning, which is where I really saw it starting to work. So this is in about 2008, 2009. We were running a research trial for people who were um, socially phobic and also had symptoms of panic. And most of that group were housebound. They hadn't come out, for, you know, really to kind of go outside to put the washing on the line in quite some time. Obviously, there's symptoms of depression that are emerging in that context as well. So you've got a group that is not well suited to coming into a doctor's office to do patient. I think it was maybe my second, third research trial that I'd been involved in as part of this lab. And I was one of the clinicians that was working doing the phone coaching. And so when we were creating our hierarchies of steps to start to get them back going, you know, step number one was really, okay, what could you do today to try to get out of the house? And they've watched a video online, maybe two videos that have explained basic principles of doing graded exposure, which is a, a treatment for being able to help people to, to take steps to overcome anxiety. Normally someone with that level of severity if, I'd, if they'd even managed to come into my office, I knew that I was really looking at what I would say is probably like a 12-month treatment period to start to get them back up and running. And that's honestly, if they're lucky to get in. In the interventions, I'm having come, watched a couple of videos. They were coming in much more prepared and much more settled because they're at home and they're less anxious at home. And they were able to see, okay, the purpose of this call is I've got to create this hierarchy. I don't have to kind of scaffold them up to get to that point. So I've already skipped four, ses four sessions to get to that. Then I was noticing, hang on, the next time I called that person back, they haven't just gone outside. They've done three more steps down their step ladder and they're off down the shops talking to people. That never used to happen for me when I was in face to face. It was very, very slow steps, taking it slow, making sure that they weren't going to relapse as going through this. What I saw from doing that style of intervention was that it was for, especially for some of these groups, it was working much more on self-efficacy because 
they had the tools they needed because they could go through the video library and say, okay, I can, I can see step one, I can see step two, I can see step three, I'll watch these videos. Now I can take these steps when I feel ready. Whereas I think that was a very clear shift in the balance of power that I'd been used to in my therapy sessions, where it was much more didactic. I had taken a style in my sessions of saying, let's take this slow, follow me through this, and I'll show you how to get better. Whereas they'd said, I've got this tool, I'm ready to get better, I'm going to take this step. And it was just me calling up and saying, great, well done, keep going. And that, that, that was really impressed me to be able to see that those types of results were possible through digital interventions where it was a very light touch for a clinician. We're talking to Jay Spence. He's a psychologist and healthcare executive. He wrote the Kevin MD article, Mental Health and the Balance Between Technology and the Human Touch. Jay, what are some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? It's the same message that I always ask everybody for whenever I'm um, talking to people. It's, we've seen some massive changes in the destigmatization of mental health across the last couple of years since the pandemic. I would just really ask that everybody keep doing that great work. We're starting to see the outcomes of it already in terms of people um, feeling a lot more comfortable about talking about mental health in their workplace with their friends, with their family. I still think we've got a really long way to go. The best way to be able to do it is to, to always be reflecting about whether or not you're talking about mental health with your patients in the same way that you would talk about a physical illness or an injury, because I think that's the way that we're headed is to be able to understand that it's the time for mental health to be kind of seen with a lot less stigma than it has been. And so I appreciate all the good work that everybody's doing in order to have that happen. Jay, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. Thanks again for being on the show. Pleasure. Thanks, Kevin.